all the animals. In, in October, David Rosenfeld, who writes a wonderful series with dogs, not cats, and uh, the Golden Rescue, Golden Retriever Rescue Group always comes to David's groups. And when David lived in California, he would adopt a dog that night and drive it home. Wow. But now that he's in Maine, he can't do that. But we've raised a lot of money for dogs as well as cats, proving cool. that we are even-handed, right? Very cool. <laughs> yep. Anyway, thank you so thank you, much for you, coming. Thank you, guys. You thank you. And if you, if you didn't have a chance to see a kitten or hold a kitten, they are still up in front. And it's, it's a really nice feeling, isn't it, to kind of do that. So Karen has just been exposed to the puppies that we adopted a year ago, and they only weighed four pounds. And yes. now we can't even they pick up more. one of them. Yes. I know. They weigh considerably more. <laughs> they do, indeed. Anyway, what a treat it is to see Karen. It's been like three years. Mm -hmm. So welcome back. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Um, and we heard a talk about um, Girl Forgotten. I did remember to bring it copy up. But I wanted to point out to you that just for us, there is an insert in your book called Confidential. And it is a case file created by Jean Perrin at her publisher, um, which I think is really nice. And maybe Karen can tell you more than I, what is this? Because you haven't seen it yet, have you? Well, you showed it to me briefly, and what my first thought was, wow, these letters are so tiny. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it is a, a witness statement. So there are witness statements throughout the, the book um, that uh, they wanted to put in all different sorts of uh, typesetting, which I overruled. You did. Uh, because they wanted it to look cursive or like people's handwriting, and it was illegible to someone like me. Um, <laughs> so it's my book. So, <laughs> but this is one of them. Uh, this is a suspect in the crime. Right. It's yes. very cool. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty neat. So anyway, only you will actually get this as part of your book. And this is also Karen's publication day. So when you get your book signed, yay, it's a party, right? When you get your book signed, you could ask her to date it if you'd like to, because that's kind of nice to have a book then, you know, on the very day that it appears. So. Um, I treated Karen to a monsoon just a little while ago. I don't know where it's been raining, but up at our house, my husband cooked dinner for her. Uh, there, there are multiple reasons why authors come to Phoenix. Um, it isn't just for you guys, although you're probably, what, the major reason, wouldn't you say? Probably, yeah. Probably so. Right. But anyway, we had a sudden downpour, so, um, you know. You've, have you ever seen rain in Phoenix? Never. I've been coming here 20-something years, yep. plus years. Never seen it rain. No. So, I know, it's been a remarkable summer, hasn't it? Last week, I was telling Karen, when Sandra Brown was here, I kept trying to move everybody. I think I think at least one of you was here. I kept trying to say, guys, it's going to rain. You know, we need to move this on. No, 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 everybody wanted to schmooze. By the time we left, the water was so high in the parking lot, it was almost up to my knees. Um, you know, and, and I was really worried that everybody was going to, like, skateboard across and wind <laughs> up in ghastly heap in front of the pizzeria, but it worked out. Anyway, Karen, talk to us a bit about pieces of her, because um, I think that it's, this is, the same character, Andrea, uh, who has now made it to be a U.S. Marshal. But why don't you sort of fill everybody in on pieces of her and the video and whatever else you want to talk about. Well, I just want to talk about kittens. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it, so it, th this book does have Andrea, and it's it's not really a sequel to Pieces no. of Her. It's more like it's in the world of the, the story because it's very different from pieces of her in a lot of ways, mostly because Andrea has become a U.S. Marshal, as Barbara said. And we meet her on the day she's graduating Marshall School. And this is a, a, a the, the training takes place at a federal law en enforcement training center that's in Brunswick, Georgia. And the weather there makes this look like winter um, mm. because it's just grueling and humid and horrible most of the time it's very tropical and they train in that environment and you know, they go through the same training fbi dea and other federal law enforcement go through but then they stay additional weeks and they fight in sand pits hand to hand and it's men and women and they don't match you with whoever they think you know would be fair it's all as dirty fighting as you can do 
because criminals aren't going to be pulling their punches and they want you to be able to, to do what you need to do in the field. So it was really fascinating talking to all these U.S. Marshals. And I thought, you know, one of the ways Andrea kind of got pushed out of the nest in pieces of her was to learn that her mom was a stole, stone cold criminal and that and for horrible things to happen. And I thought, well, she needs another growth spurt. So ma let me make her a U.S. Marshal and put her in jeopardy again. Um, and if any of you have, oops, any of you have children who won't leave your, your garage apartment, it's a great, brutal murder is a great way to get them to change their lives. Um, and I see people nodding. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I, th this is what Andrea is thrown into, but the, the, the core of the story is a cold case that happened 40 years ago in 1982. It's about Emily Vaughn, and she's in the first chapter. So, you know, if you've ever read one of my books, it's a really bad idea to be in the first chapter of one of my books. So it's not a spoiler to tell you things don't go well for Emily. Uh, but she's a teenager. She's about to graduate high school. She's grown up in this really a small clique of friends who she's known all her life and she trusts completely, but then something bad has happened to her, which you'll have to read the book to find out about, or maybe we'll spoil it for you later. Maybe. Um, but she's outside the clique when we meet her in that first chapter. She's been cast out. You know, we talk about canceling a lot with the internet, but any girl who's been to a high school in America knows what canceling is. Uh, and she's been canceled. She's done something that has made her a bad girl. And uh, that's a new thing for her. And in a lot of ways, it gives her a sense of freedom. And you know that, that's her story. But Andrea, as a marshal, gets assigned to protect a judge. You know, A lot of people didn't know about judicial security by the US marshals until, until very recently, thanks to all these recent death threats that people are giving uh, federal judges. And so as a marshal, she's supposed to protect this judge, but she manages to also start investigating Emily's crime uh, from 40 years ago. And she has definitely an ulterior motive to do that. So a U.S. marshal is a really cool thing to, um, to give Emily um, as, a, um, as a job because Andrea. U.S. marshal, I'm sorry, Andrea, right. Emily's, yeah, right. Because um, U.S. marshals get to go anywhere. Um, they're not stuck in any particular jurisdiction, like a like a cop or something. Um, and they do have a, a wide range of. Um, I mean, they do witness protection. You know, they do a lot of things. So, if Andrea is to make another appearance, it wouldn't be weird if she were somewhere entirely different and an entirely different case. So you've got a lot of freedom. Um, any of you who are John Sanford fans will will know that Lucas Davenport finally became a U.S. Marshal for this very reason, right? That, you know, he'd worked forever in the Twin Cities and the whole bit, and the only way that he could really gain mobility and do different things was to become a Marshal. Um, so I think it's a, but I didn't realize their training was that rigorous. That's really it's interesting. It's very intense. And you used to have to, every year as a Marshal, you would have to pass a physical fitness test uh, or you would be fired. But some of the tubbier marshals filed a complaint, and now, uh, now if if you can't pass the test, that's bad. But if you do pass it, I think you get two weeks off. So, oh, so. everybody wants two weeks off, right? Yeah. But it's our oldest law enforcement agency. Yeah. Washington himself created the marshals, and like Barbara said, they go anywhere. Like if there's a murder in Antarctica, which Lisa Gardner just went to Antarctica, and I can't wait to go, so I might have to do some research. Uh, and go to Antarctica and have Andrea show up there, maybe. Um, but it, it really is fascinating, all the things they do. They're kind of like the Marines or the Swiss Army knife of our federal law enforcement. So they protected the trucks delivering the vaccines. They protect judges. They, I mean, they're just all, all over the country and all over the world. So there's a lot to do with it. And handily, they could go to Antarctica to bring back a fleeing felon. Because, exactly. you know, they can operate. The FBI can't operate outside the United States. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's part of the deal with the FBI. In the same way that police really can't um, operate outside their jurisdiction legally. But a U.S. marshal can, in fact, go to Ushuaia or somewhere. Um, and, it, you know, that's a whole complicated world because there are countries where you can retrieve 
people who fled the United States and there are other countries that don't have treaties to do that. And, you know, when you read about some of these guys, you know, where did they, they flee? If you remember, was it Goshen that was liberated from, but not by U.S. Marshals, uh, they probably would have done a more interesting job. He's, um, he's living in Lebanon, as I remember, because there's no extradition treaty between Lebanon and Japan. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a muddled world out there. Anyway, one of the things that I noticed, I was reading um, some comments about um, Girl Forgotten, and virtually everybody commented, talked about Andrea has gained agency, which mm -hmm. is the sort of buzzword yeah. thing. But anyway, um, as compared to in pieces of her, mm -hmm. she now has um, much more um, strength and, you know, self-esteem and reliability and all. So did that come in part from the training? I think so, yeah. <clears throat> but also in pieces of her, you know, she's, she describes herself as a, an amoeba responding to stimuli. So she's very aware in that elder millennial kind of way that she hasn't quite managed to fulfill all the potential she had uh, or thought she had when she was in high school and when she was in art school. You know, she's kind of disillusioned with the world. She's crushed by student loan debt. I mean, it, it's a really familiar story of, you know, why even try if I'm never going to be able to buy a house or even afford a nice car because I've got all this debt. Um, but she she does that throughout pieces of her. She kind of transforms herself. Again, I highly recommend Violent Crime. Um, <laughs> and it really tests her character and it changes her in very meaningful ways. But there's something that her mother, Laura, says to her at the beginning of Girl Forgotten. And she says, wherever you go, there you are. Because Andrea's response to her life has been, I need to change everything around me. And anyone who's uh, like had a, a friend in their 20s who's like, why do I always end up with these shitty guys? And then you're like, why do you always choose the shitty guys, right? <laughs> and it, it, it's really true for Andrea, you know, she's the same person and she ends up going to this small coastal town uh, in Delaware, very much like the small coastal town she grew up in. And she realizes maybe the rest of the world isn't the problem, maybe it's me. And maybe I need to do some things that, uh, that would you know, give me more agency in my life. And I, you know, I think that's kind of her journey. And I love writing about her because I'm very interested in characters who change. You know, my first character I started writing about in Grant County, Sarah Linton, I've been writing for her about 20 years. And I very deliberately wanted her to grow and change. I was very arrogant to think there would be a series. Um, but, you know, when I wrote that first book, I had the idea for the second one. And I wanted her to respond to what she was seeing because I was, I, you know, in a lot of series books, and, and some people, some authors do this wonderfully, Sue Grafton, Lee Child, you know, the Lee Child, the, the Jack Reacher you meet in the first book is the same as you meet in the last one, right? He's very consistently the same person. But I wanted to write in a very realistic way about horrific crime and an un unflinching way. And that, to me, it, it gives you the responsibility to show how crime can change how you respond as a person, you know, and how crimes against children, for instance, or sexual assault. It doesn't just happen once. There's the actual crime. But it's it's the sort of thing that, that you hold in your memory that happens through the rest of your life, right? It's always a part of you in a way. And a lot of people are able to overcome that, and that's wonderful, but some aren't. So I wanted to talk about those nuances in survival. And Andrea is a, a good character for that because she doesn't start off in a, a typical, I guess, Karen Slaughter, strong woman character, but she becomes that toward the end. Um, and in this, it, she picks up from that and she becomes even stronger. So in a way, it's kind of a coming of age story. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is great. So aside, before we talk more about Girl Forgotten, in the, in the total crapshoot that um, Hollywood or television is in terms of what books they choose to do and what books they don't, why did they pick pieces of her out of your entire oeuvre? Did they give you a reason? Did you, because, you know, I don't imagine that you told them this was the book you wanted, although maybe you did, and I just... Well, the, the Will Trent stuff was already optioned. Right. Um, and so was um, Pretty Girls. 
Okay. And so the you know the the producer of Bruna Papandrea of Made Up Stories loves women's stories. Okay. And I guess I had to wait a long time for streaming to take off because you would never see my this kind of book on a network television show, right? Um, because I mean, you could you could kind of see it, but there's a lot of um, things that they just couldn't show, and the the producer got that, and the showrunner slash writer got that, and talked to me because you know as a writer, when you write a book, you get a lot of phone calls from people, and sometimes they're like, well, what if we said it in South London instead of the southern part of the United States? Or yeah. I mean, they have really crazy ideas about changing things. And I understand some things have to be changed, but they really these these people really understood the characters and the story and how important it was to not make it a love story uh, between Andrew and Mike. It's really about a mother and daughter finding each other. And uh, you know, I, I trusted them to do it, and I think they did an exceptional job. So the corollary question is, Dad, when did you start writing this? Was it after the TV came on, before the TV came on? It's a long journey for a book to be written and actually make it into print, much longer than you all may be aware. Yeah. Well, so I started reading the scripts for Pieces of Her, and I had thought Pieces of Her would be a standalone. But every book starts with a question that you answer by the end. And I, I had another question about Andrea because okay. she's got a really horrible criminal father and she's chosen to be a marshal. And we all want to think that if you put the badge on, that means you're a good person. Mm -hmm. But that's a choice, right? We know that some are not. And so Andrea has to be put in this position where she chooses the kind of person she wants to be. And that's the question is, who is she going to be? So that question came to me while I was reading the scripts because I thought, what is she going to do next? Uh, but it wasn't, this book was supposed to be out this year, mm -hmm. but the series was supposed to be out last year, but COVID shut them down. They were three days from principal photography in Vancouver. COVID happened. Then, you know, Tony Collette's Australian, Bella, who plays Andrew, is Australian, the producer's Australian. They're like, let's go to Australia and do this. <laughs> And everybody had to do a two week quarantine in a hotel room, which I, you know, I'm very introverted and I thought that would be fantastic. Um, but Not it was for like, them. No, no. they had nurses call them every day to make sure they weren't spreading shit on the walls, you know, because mm. after a while it was a bit intense. Um, and they filmed it there and they did do some filming in Georgia. I got to see it on set. That was interesting. Uh, and they filmed in Brunswick. And so you see Andrea take the longest bike ride ever. She starts going down Main Street and she's in Brunswick, Georgia. And then she gets home and she's in the a coastal Sydney town. Um, so that, that's pretty cool. And I'm, I'm actually in um, the fourth episode. I'm going into the bookstore and Andrea's going out. And it's very quick because, and that I'm so happy because Bella is extremely tall and beautiful and Australian, and I am not any of those things. And so, you know, I didn't want people to pause it and make a comparison. <laughs> but, but again, that was so crazy because that, film, that, that scene where she's coming out of the bookstore was filmed in underground Atlanta. But when she's in the bookstore, that was 40 minutes away at night at a Barnes and Noble. Um, so it was really crazy seeing the, the way they do things. How many of you noticed Karen in the scene? Did you? And I, I asked Excellent. that because, um, because you really had to pay attention for those of you who watch Reacher. Lee Child has a tiny cameo yeah. right at the end. But I thought most of you probably wouldn't have recognized him or even noticed him. I had to, you know, and that was that, I you know, Alfred Hitchcock thing. And then if you remember Morse, Colin Dexter, for any of you who watched it, Colin Dexter appeared in every Morse. You know, it was kind of like a little signature thing. And uh, Jack Carr has a moment where he's either blown up or, or you know, whatever in the terminal list. So is that fun for you? You know, no, or torture really, because you were next to the Australians. You know, it it's weird because when you feel scrutinized, you forget things like how to walk. 
<laughs> right? And so I, I, you know, they did all different sorts of takes and I'm walking down the street going left, right, no, wait, 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 you know, and it was, and then I was like, oh, are your shoulders back? And it was very, and I had to carry a purse. I don't carry a purse. And a friend of mine was with me and I was carrying it like this. And she said, no, and it had a tiny little strap that, so I had to put the tiny, and I was like, why do you have to hold it? Like, what is stupid, why do you have this? So, that was a whole thing yeah it was very yeah i'm not i'm not used to that i i have great respect for it it's, it, i did a, a a photo shoot many years ago with a bunch of atlanta authors like emily giffen and kitty stockett and you know and josh jackson and, and they for some reason it was for vogue they all had us in these gowns um yeah and you know of course kitty and emily were like you know, where's right. my pearls? And Joss and I were like, oh, what is this? <laughs> um, and it was really, it gave us, it was all day and it gave us such an appreciation for models to be, I mean, it's hard to just stand there while someone yeah. is constantly taking photographs and hold a pose and not freak out and, you know, think I'm holding my gut in and all this other stuff. It was a horrible experience. <laughs> and this was kind of like that. Because, you know, I'm, I'm not used to, like, you're all staring at me now. That's <laughs> no, I'm very you know, aware of that. This is so great. I mean, uh, you know, we've, we've been doing this for 33 years in October. And, and digression is really the whole point of coming. We've had people actually say to us, they don't come for the authors or the book talk. They just come for the digressions because you never know where we're going. Um, and, and right now, we just had one. It's so exciting. <laughs> I thought, wow, we're back. But actually, the reason I asked you that, that question was because I have talked to many authors whose books are dramatized one way or another. And, you know, a question is, does that affect the writing of your of your future books, you know? I mean, in, in your case, clearly you were inspired to ask this second question. But, you know, in writing this book, did the, the, the TV characters speak to you in any way? I mean... No, can, can, I was very worried about that. No because kidding. I mean, Tony Collette did a phenomenal job, but the show is the show and the book is the book. And, and I really didn't want that to intrude. And I was actually at the tail end of writing this when I got the, the, the episodes that I could start watching. And I was really nervous about it. I wanted to finish before I did because I didn't want it to intrude. Uh, because it's really important to me. You know, I'm, it's the same thing going on with Will Trent right now that ABC has... Um, they just green lighted and they're going to start Great. filming in the fall and they're going to hopefully it'll be on in uh, January or February. And I, I watched the pilot and, you know, the will in my head doesn't look like that will, but the story is there. The feelings and the mo and this guy is pretty freaking sexy. Uh, <laughs> And he's got great chemistry with Betty, which is very important. Um, and the women playing Amanda and Faith don't look like my Amanda and Faith, but they've got amazing chemistry together. Their energy is so great in a way that I would never have written those characters. So in some ways, it's good for me because my will in my head yeah. looks different. But, you know, everybody's like I always do these little periodic things on Facebook. What does what will, will Trent look like? And sometimes it'll be like Eric Estrada, or you know. And you think, well, let's Google him and see see if he's still alive. But you know, everybody has a different idea of the characters, and that's why books are so wonderful because you can project right. what you Your want idea. into them. Yeah. Um, so it is different, but it, I did have to think about okay. I don't want this to intrude in the, in my story because the book is my book. And then sometimes the the actor kind of hijacks the role of storyteller from there. I I have never forgotten. Gosh, it was maybe thirty years ago. Whenever, whenever um, P. D. James, um, what's the name of his? You know the Dalglish. Yes. Not the one that's currently on, but the older Dalglish with Roy Marson. I think it was was a really hot thing on television. It must have been in the early 90s. And I was in London, and I was at a meeting of the Detection Club or some such thing anyway, and Phyllis and I had been sitting around in the bathroom at the Savoy talking to each other to sort of get away from the crowd. But um, there was a public reception, and when she came out, Roy Marston was there. And so there she was, and there was Roy Marston, and all the people, the fans, came up to talk to him. 
they totally ignored her because he was their Dalgleish, you know, and so, and, and she was standing there and I could see her getting more and more frustrated, you know, because um, he had become the spokesman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would think that would be sort of unnerving. Um, I don't, I don't know. You probably would want to talk to this guy because he's really, really sexy. So I would totally, <laughs> I totally, I'd be like, that's fair, right? Okay. You know? But how would you feel if a fan went up and asked him what was next for Will Trent and you were standing right there? Well, but that's his, his, he's Will Trent on the show. They're not. No, but so, they were asking about the book, I think. Maybe well, not. hopefully he would know the answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I've never. I just feel like I have such ownership of these characters yeah. myself. So, uh, I mean, we'll see. I might like stab him or something. <laughs> yeah. Or kidnap him. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. So back to Girl Forgotten. Um, Long Bill Beach, 1982. 1982 is a really different world. And so, I, I don't want to do spoilers here, but another question that I couldn't help but ask myself when I read this was, you know, were you influenced by current events such as Roe versus Wade and yeah. so forth. Because I wrote it before. You did? Yeah, yeah, before the leak even. So yeah, I was writing in 1982, uh, completely oblivious to what was coming. Um, but it was, a, it, I, a lot of times writers will write something. Um, Alif Berg did this, you know, and on her pub day, she wrote a book with a mass shooting and on her publication day, uh, there, there was, was a mass one. shooting, right? And in, it, she was like, oh, my God, what should we do? And it's like, well, one, when is there not going to be a mass shooting, yeah, right? Because yeah. it's so common now. Um, and, you know, a lot of times when we write books, the right. actual thing happens when they come out. And we're not, we don't have a crystal ball. We're just, I think writers really pay attention to things like social issues yeah. and what's going on in, in crime, cr you know, criminals and w what new thing they're doing to do their criming. Um, we keep track of that. I mean, I wrote a book three or four years ago about uh, white supremacist militias overtaking the, the Capitol. So, you know, Tom Clancy wrote a book about an airplane hitting the White House before 9-11. Yeah. So, it, it, I don't know. Mostly, I just say to people in law enforcement, what are you worried about? And when I was writing that book, they're like, we're super worried about militias and white supremacists because whenever you have a war, those when those some of those soldiers come back, they feel very disillusioned, obviously, with the, the, what's gone on and they, they've traumatized. And a lot of them are seduced by the idea of white supremacy or militia or that sort of thing. A small, very small percentage, but you know, we're a big country, so a small percentage can be a lot of people. And that was something that law enforcement, FBI, state, local police were talking about all the time a few years ago. But so. to write this, you really had to get into a kind of mindset of 1982, yeah. um, which makes you realize how, how things have changed in a relatively short time in history. Absolutely. 40 years is not really all that long in the, in the span of history. Um, but, you know, violence against women and rape are things that, you know, you have written about and, you know, clearly anger you and anger me too. Yeah. Um, and so it was dealing with that in 1982 might be different than trying to deal with it today. Well, you know, weirdly, from a statistical standpoint, when Ronald Reagan was president, one in every 20 rape prosecutions was successful. And now it's one in every 50. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I thought it would go the other way. Yeah, no. And, you know, the, the, a lot of there's a lot of talk about defunding the police. We've been doing that for years, mm -hmm. particularly in small towns. Mm -hmm. So in Georgia, for instance, you have counties with the sheriff agency where maybe they have one murder every five years. And now they have 12 or 13 murders in one year and they don't have the staff. The staff isn't paid well. They don't get the training they need. And that's defunding the police. And we've been doing that for years. We've been defunding education for years, you know? And, and so, so, where are my teachers at? Uh, so that, that, I mean, that's something that we've really kind of, you know, we've kind of lost sight that we have to actually invest in things. Right. Um, and I think we need to start investing in things again. Yeah, I got in a huge argument with my father uh, he's not on online, so I know I won this argument because, 
you know, we were talking about baby boomers and the, the greatest generation. And um, I said, you know, dad, when you, you I mean, my dad worked his ass off, but he benefited, if you can call it that, from Jim Crow. There were no women in the workforce. He, you know, so he was competing against maybe 30% of the population. Mm. And yeah, he, he worked his ass off. But also, you know, when those guys came back from World War II, rightfully so, we helped them with education. We helped them with housing. We helped, you know, we built suburbs for them. We made sure women were out of the workforce and staying home and taking care of them. You know, all these things. But we invested in them in a way that we don't invest in people anymore. Um, and in education, and too. And in education, particularly, right. yeah. I know. And it, I think, myself, it's becoming a muddle. If every parent gets to choose a different path for their child, then why don't we just do homeschooling and, you know, <laughs> well, seriously, you know, forget I don't about know. it. I, I can't stand children, so that would be <laughs> like the worst possible thing. <laughs> Right. So we're not talking about schooling here. Or you know, um, in 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 constructing, you know, Karen's books are largely called thrillers, and yet, you know, the Will Trent, their police procedurals really is what they are, and the structure of a procedural is different in general than I had this discussion last night with Ken Kruger, so I'm all primed for this um, than it is for a thriller because. Um, in a in a procedural or an ordinary mystery, the real questions usually are uh, who did it, why they did it. Motive is a is a very big thing, and occasionally how they did it, like in a locked room mystery, but that's a fairly small thing. But a thriller generally is some kind of a contest between a protagonist and an antagonist, and the question is who's going to win. You know who who is going to prevail in all of this. So it's difficult for me to apply the term thriller in many ways to Girl Forgotten, particularly because there's an old case, the cold case, that is important for Andrea. I mean, part of the reason she's there is um, to to find out what happened to Emily, mm -hmm. and then you know there's the new stuff going on. But yet we we're calling it a thriller, so I'm not sure why. Well, I've always thought thriller had to do with pacing. No, I don't think so. Yeah, I think it I has... have, I've always, well, I disagree with you, Barbara. All right. <laughs> I think they have to be faster. I definitely agree that you can't take your time. And, mm -hmm. uh, but a, a thriller in general revolves, you know, they're... A cat and mouse. Yeah, well, yeah. it really is an antagonist. Pro to, and, and very often you know who the antagonist is from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas you don't necessarily in a police procedure or, or whatever the perpetrator is not necessarily recognized. Part of the journey may be to find out who it actually is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't disagree that, that thrillers are about pacing, but I think they're more than that. So, Well, I mean, I think crime novels in general, whether it's a mystery or a thriller or a crime, whatever, they're all hybrids now. Yeah. You know, they're doing a lot of different things. Like I write about lawyers and doctors and police officers and normal people who are in really bad situations. And the, you know, my Will Trents are definitely love stories, right? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry guys, you're reading some romance there. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also, you know, kind of social constructs of the, yeah. to hold a mirror up to people and say, hey, this is what's going on. Are you okay with that, right? And sometimes like with false witness, it's like, we lived through a plague. We're still living through a plague. I want to show what our lives were like and how things changed, how language changed. Like if you and I were talking about a mask pre-COVID, you'd think I was going to a spa. But now, I mean, we immediately associate it with face right. masks, right? So, you know, how does language change because of how the world changes? And, and that's something that I've always been interested in. I'm having a senior moment. Does anybody have a question while I try to remember what my next one was? <laughs> Seriously, this is an interactive yes. program. Yes, Miss Lauder. This is Miss Oh dear. Now, you've already said that the actor that will take the Will Trent. Yes. <laughs> but how much input do you really have during the screenplay? 
It depends, you know, um, it, it, so I get consultation, but a lot of people get that, which means I can be overruled. But you know, it's it's different because when a book with a book, you don't have to think about how people look, right? And how people interact with each other. Um, and so there's so much more that goes into casting than just this guy looks like I think Will should look. It's does he have good chemistry with the actress who's gonna be Faith and you know, does he like dogs and does, you know, just how he comes across on screen. And it's, you know, it's always surprising to me when I meet really famous people, one, because their heads are ginormous, you know, <laughs> um, which is what the look they want. Um, but because they're so different in person than they are on screen. And sometimes that can be profoundly disappointing, yes. right? Because you think, wow, you're not clever and sexy, are you? Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so it's a, it's kind of a different art to doing that. And I don't understand that art. And I don't know, I know it when I, when I see it. So it's sort of like um, pornography, you know? Yeah. I know it when I see it. Um, but there are people who are much better at that. Uh, it's sort of like when I get my book jackets and sometimes I don't like them, um, but my publisher knows all the book jackets that are going to be out when my book is out and, you know, the kind of look that, that makes my readers interested in picking up the book and branding and all this other stuff that I just don't have time for because I'd rather write the books. Um, so that I, I get, you know, and when they told me Tony Collette, what am I going to say? No, I don't want one of the greatest actresses in the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But she wasn't my idea of Laura, but she's amazing as Laura on the show. So, you know, um, I mean, I guess that answers your question. I don't I don't get much input, but I have great respect for what they do. Can I ask a follow-up? Sure. Yes. How did he possibly take the set? Yes. I know who you're going to ask. And the the book is um, <laughs> I can actually answer that yeah. question because I have asked it of Lee and his answer was that at the time that the movie was optioned there were no tall box office male stars in Hollywood. Yeah. That's all it came down to is that Tom Cruise was the draw and to to do the movie they needed a bankable star and there wasn't anybody who looked like Richard. So it was a purely pragmatic decision, yeah. you know, and, um, and the authors... actors are very short. The women are very tall and the men are very short. It's very strange. <laughs> I remember reading about, I mean, proving how old I am when they made Shane. Alan Ladd was like the male lead and it introduced Jack Palance. And I, anyway, Alan Ladd was like our size and he had to stand on a box um, in order to, you know, even embrace his wife, Jean Arthur and so forth. So there's a long, a long history of height disparities and so forth. If you watch the new Reacher, the guy is a Hulk, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, he's, he's, he's too big. He's, he's, he's really big. big. Actually, as an aside, which I have said to Lee, I think the, the person who stole the new Reacher was the woman. Because, and yeah, and also the Boston cop. And yeah. it's really tragic for me that, that by definition, a Reacher can't have those yeah, characters reappear <laughs> yeah. because they were so, yeah. they were just so wonderful. Yes, the, the woman was amazing. I, I thought it, but you know, if, if you read how Lee describes Jack Reacher, yeah. He's a monster, yeah. right? I mean, he's not a, a handsome guy. Of course, he's going to have sex with every woman he meets. But, you know, I mean, he's not. So, well, someone had a yeah right there. Um, <laughs> but he's really not an attractive guy. Um, My husband was pointing out to me that Sunday night in the Cardinals game, there was a tackle, I think, or a linebacker playing for Washington, Baltimore, who was six feet eight, weighs 390 pounds. And Rob said, you just can hardly believe how big he was, you know, I mean, he was there at the game, not watching it on television, this guy. And I thought, OK, you know, that's kind of Reacher, yeah. right? You know, it's just um, scary. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really. So um, I remember what it was in, in corollary to your question, um, audiobooks. So mm -hmm. you do they give you like a selection of different voices and you get mm -hmm. some input, but ultimately the audio company chooses the narrator, well, don't yes they? Well, yes and no. It depends no? on your audio company. Because When I first started out, the, the readers were trying to do Southern accents, 
and it sounded like they'd like shaken a trailer and uh you know someone popped out and sticks came out of their mouths they were, i mean just no southern act or they sounded like scarlett o'hara um in, in the movie and she did a great southern accent for that period but we're not in that period anymore you know and julia roberts who was born up the street from where i grew up said when she had to learn the southern accent for steel magnolias because no one believed that what the way she talked was a southern accent yeah um and so now i love the woman who's my reader and when i i'm actually i, I moved um audio publishers many years ago and i said part of the deal is i want kathleen to stay as my reader because she's does a really even though she's te from texas that's not the south she's got people from savannah so she knows the difference and i think she does an excellent job but i said i you know i won't go anywhere without her. Oh, good. Wonderful. Anybody else have a question they'd like to ask? Oh, good. I wanted to do the earlier ones. We're talking about that. And she's a really good reader. I'll let her know. There was somebody over there. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, well, it's exactly what you said. I, I have a lot of police officers I speak with. Most of them retired and most of them women because they don't give a shit. And so they'll just tell me everything. Um, for the, you know, I, I didn't really have a martial contact, but a, a fr Lisa Gardner uh, knew an FBI agent who could get me a commercial contact. And it's a really small group. So like I, the second one I talked to knew I talked to the first one and they're like, you talked to this one. And it was really, it was kind of like, wow, this is kind of strange. What are they tapping my phones? Um, and I, you know, I think that Justified is a great example of what a U.S. Marshal is because they're real dick swingers. And they have to be, you know, considering what they do, it's really, you know, it, it's not like, and I'm not comparing it you know, like in, in machoism or machismo, but you know, if, if you're a police officer and you, you pull someone over, that can be very dangerous, but you have no idea who this person is, right? If you're a U.S. Marshal and you're going to somebody's house to pick them up, you know who that is, you know they're a bad guy, they probably like, you know, they're on the run from something, you know, their history, they, they could be a pedophile. Marshals do a lot of tracking at the federal level of pedophiles. Mm -hmm. You know, on Halloween, they kind of go out in groups and knock on the doors of pedophiles and make sure they're at home, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they do all these kind of interesting things. And it, it, was, it was fascinating to talk to them. And, you know, I talked to a, a female marshal and I said to her the same thing I always say to female law enforcement officers why in the hell would you do this and it's not because they can't do it i mean they women in policing there's all kinds of studies about how exceptional they are because they're very good at bringing down the temperature and and you know de-escalation which wasn't really a thing in policing until the 70s when women were introduced into policing and you know it took about 10 years and the guys were like oh maybe these ladies have you know a better way of doing it other than beating the crap out of everybody right um, but I, I ask, why do you do this? Because, you know, most of the time their, their mothers definitely don't want them to do this job. Like they're terrified mm -hmm. of them doing it. Their fathers are worried, right? Um, you know, they men don't want to date them for the most part, which is why, you know, cops end up marrying cops usually five or six times. Um, <laughs> and, and it's really, really difficult because, you know, a lot of people don't want to think about women as being in a position where they're vulnerable, but also they don't want to think about them in a position of them being very powerful, mm -hmm. right? So it's a really hard line to walk. And, and a lot of female police officers say to me, you know, the biggest thing is trying to find a really good guy because we see so many bad guys. We have to remind ourselves that not all men are horrific monsters because mm -hmm. that's what we deal with every day so i talk to them i talk you know to a lot of different people doctors nurses one thing I, I think i'm a pretty good mimic so if i talk to someone enough i can kind of pick up what they're doing what the lingo is i try to be as realistic as i can you know but i, I am also writing fiction so i can make things up um and i try but i try to get particularly with medical stuff with sarah i have a, this doctor who's so patient with me 
and I'm his favorite medical student because I can't <laughs> kill anybody. Uh, but you know, the, the, the other thing yeah. is you've got to know who to call because I, for once I had a medical examiner and I would say to her, well, what if we do this? That would never happen. Okay. Well, what if this happens? That would never happen. And so you need someone who's like, well, that might not happen, but if it did, this is what would happen, right? And and you could have the smartest person in the world, but if they can't talk about what they do in a way that makes sense, they're not going to be particularly helpful. So it's a matter of picking the right people, knowing who to call, and just, just keeping those relationships going. So hopefully uh, it's authentic and you're not going to arrest me if you're a police officer. Okay, good, good. Patrick, you came out of your lair. Do you have... Yeah. Did you have a question from the online audience that you wanted to? Yes. Let me get my act together here. Um, okay. Yeah, there was a question about, somebody said that they, they liked your appearance on Holy Moly. Uh, <laughs> and uh, how did that come about? I lost my damn mind. <laughs> um, so I, I watched the first season of Holy Moly, which is a extreme putt-putt, right? Oh, and. Man. I love the show. It was fun. You know, I don't like these shows where people, you think, wow, they're going to die, right? Yeah, right. Or, or lose a limb. And it just was like good and fun. And, and I love Putt-Putt. I grew up playing Putt-Putt. I adore it. And so I mentioned to my publicist that I'd love to do this. And she's like, we're going to make that happen. <laughs> and so she made it happen. And I ended up on the show right before, when I came home, literally we had the, the COVID lockdown. Um, but, uh, I got there on set and they like said where we're going to play putt putt, you know, cause you, you have a, a putt off between an, you and another person. And, um, they showed me the course and like these gophers were coming up and I was like, okay, well that's not too bad. And then they said, but first, before you put on this course, you'll be atop this mountain. And it was like this bouncy mountain with a bucking um, gopher on top. And I just started laughing because I'm like, I am too old to be doing this shit, right? And there was no way for me to leave without humiliating myself. No, no. So like the whole time, and, and you know, they, they won't let you on your phone or anything, so you can't phone a friend and say, like, girl taught me how to do this. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I ended up, that's how I was like lifted up on a bucket truck and put on top of a gopher. And it, it was like a bucking bull. And so I had to hold on which is like really humiliating. Hold on to it. And eventually I just got thrown off and bounced down the mountain. And then I had to putt. You had to putt? I had to putt. <laughs> and I was like, please do not get this in. Because I could see what the other courses were. I was like, do not get this in. I was, I was and the guy I was playing against was really good. And, and yeah. I was, I was like, he really needs the money more than I do. I don't, <laughs> you know. Um, and so, but, you know, then I thought, well, don't, you know, don't be an idiot. Just tr do your best. Do your best. And right. it almost got in and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> uh, but I didn't make it past round one, um, which I'm really glad because the next, the, the one he had to do was run past a bunch of portalettes and the doors would open and throw you into a, a water. And uh, yeah, and I didn't want to do that. I, I got a pinhead. And I didn't want to be wet like that, and or hit in the face with a portalette. So, so you retired with honor. I did, yes. After yeah. after the golfer encounter. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, is this recorded somewhere where everybody who missed yeah, it can no, now go see it? Holy moly, season two. I don't know yeah. the episode, but um, yeah. All right. So that's your takeaway. You can go out and look for. Holy I did. Moly. I did lose my. It was like a midlife crisis. I also bought a Porsche. And I hated it because I don't have the knees for it. Oh. And, and so that like my midlife crisis was over by the time it came out. It's like, oh, my God, what did you do? <laughs> this is why you come, right? It's like true confessions or something wonderful. <laughs> Patrick, are there any other online questions? Yeah. Um, what was it like throwing out the first pitch at the Braves game? Oh, that was really That cool. was a great photo, by yeah. the way. So I got to do it with the Braves, which was very meaningful for me because, you know, my dad and I used to go to Braves games all the time. And um, also, I have a relative, Ina Slaughter, who was a, a Hall of Famer oh, baseball okay, player. Okay, really? Yeah, yeah. I remember him. Um, and uh, I threw out the first pitch at the Yankees game. 
um also right after i think it was 50 cent who did that he like threw it out and it went to new jersey <laughs> um so i was so happy about that because i thought i will not be that bad um and it, it's it's very daunting to do something like that mike Connolly's the one who got me into it because me and my big mouth because he was talking about it and i'm like gee mike it's great how you recommended all these guys to do this and he's like oh okay well i'm gonna recommend you now um, so I ended up in front of like 11 billion people, right? And my, Another chance for humiliation. Exactly. My bowels are like liquid. I'm like, ah. and, uh, and I had practiced, a, a friend of mine was a, a science teacher in New York. And so we went to her school and practiced in the gymnasium. Did and you I, do an underhand lob or did you do the whole wind no, up and the overhand? The, I did overhand and I wow. like kicked my foot out and all that stuff. You could have dislocated I so your much, shoulder. I hurt my shoulder. Yeah, I could just yeah. do that. Throw and I your did, shoulder I, out. But they let you stand in front of the plate. I'm like, of course. Right. And, it, and, it, and they it, can't hit it back at you, right? No, 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 no. no. It's just the catcher. <laughs> right. And I got it. Like it bounced a little and the catcher was like, hey, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I was like, okay, I didn't shit myself. Yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a very nice team photo on Instagram of yeah, Karen yeah. um you know winding up and doing that. Yeah. yeah. So the Atlanta right, anything else? There are some others, but does anybody here have questions? Nope. Uh, one last question before we call. Uh I, I'm curious, like it came from a broke then. Yeah. But um, uh, you know, did you end in with the in mind go trans like, you know, was the idea to continue on and build up another character? And yeah, so about my fourth Grant County book, I thought, why is anyone living here, right? <laughs> I mean, it's pedophiles and rape. I mean, it's like the Senate, right? It's really horrible, uh -huh. yeah. And so I thought at some point, it's gonna be really hard to have a believable story set where in this town, like why is anybody living there? And so I knew that it was going to end. And if you look at the order of the books, Will Trent comes before the last Grant County book, and then he has his own, another book without right. Sarah in it. And, you know, it was a very hard decision to make. And I, I wanted Will to, I wanted to have the decision have meaning because I write about really bad things and it seemed likely that bad things would happen personally. And I wanted to write in Atlanta because I thought, Okay, Atlanta's a big city. You believe a million people would get murdered there, right? And it, as opposed to a small town. And what I realized really quickly was everybody thinks of themselves in relation to where they live. So I'm not writing about, you know, Atlanta. I'm writing about a crime in Morningside or Buckhead. And, you know, it's like when you go to New York City, you know, when, you, when you say, where are you from? They don't say New York City. They say Upper West Side or Chelsea or whatever. So the neighborhoods have real identities, and I, I really enjoy writing about that. But, you know, I, it had to be for a reason. And again, it was about Sarah changing, you know, in relation to what's going on in her life. And that was very deliberate on my part for her to eventually come into Will's world. And you wanted to stay in Georgia. I did. You know, Andrew's the only one, except right. for I, Lee and I wrote a story. Delaware. Yeah. yeah. Lee Child and I wrote a, a short story yeah. together, and that's Will's first trip outside of Georgia. Yeah. Um, so that was the only, I think, the only time he'll be out of Georgia. Well, but he's a cop. Yeah. We already had that discussion. He can't be a cop in Delaware, yeah. right? So, yeah. But, you know, Atlanta's an amazing city. I mean, really fascinating. So, you know, it's a great hunting yes. ground for you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yes, way over there. <laughs> so I don't think it's Jeffrey's different in the silent wife so much as maybe we are as as people because Jeffrey still in the silent wife is doing the kind of policing that he did when I first started writing this the series with the Grant County series and it was right after 9 11 
And, you know, we were all very, um, well, most of us were very, you know, like 24, you know, get the bad guys, beat them up, that kind of thing. And, and I think business society much more trusting in the police, right? Um, that they would not abuse their power. And Jeffrey certainly is not a bad cop, but I wanted to show someone who's a good person who you root for who makes a mistake. And how, what are the repercussions of that? And I think the reason why the perception might be different is you're seeing it through Will and Sarah's eyes. And Will, of course, does not like Jeffrey at all. <laughs> but it's putting, it's contextualizing it in a different way, you know, because Lena's still doing bad Lena things. <laughs> Jeffrey's still doing kind of John Wayne things, which I love about him. But the world has changed a lot since then. Um, so um, that that was kind of the point of that story is to put it in context. And I love those earlier books, you know, because everybody wants to write about, you know, someone who's kicking ass and taking names. But what if it's the wrong ass he's kicked? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, no, he wasn't at that point. No. No, but, but when you meet him in the first book, he's already realized what a dumbass he was for cheating on her, right? So he's he, he's definitely a different person, absolutely, in The Silent Wife because it's right on the cusp of when their marriage broke up. And, you know, and also that's another thing about writing about Sarah in the present is she can see she made mistakes that contributed to their marriage breaking up. But, yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Um. Maybe I'm never say no, but you know, you Lena that? certainly is fun to write Can about. That? Can you repeat the question? Oh, oh sure. Sorry. Um, well, you, are you going to write a book about <laughs> Lena? Because yes. you did sort of. And when she went. Was it Decatur? Where was it that Lena went? Where she had a big chunk of that book? It was oh, Macon. Macon. Yeah. Macon. Yeah. That yeah. was it. You remember that long? Yeah. Right. So, you yeah. Know, Lena's a tough character. She is. I love writing her though. Absolutely. Of course you do. It's much more fun to write really bad people, right? So, Patrick, another yeah. question? Is there any any topic or any subject, because you've gone, you've gone super dark in a lot of places. Um, are there any topics that are off limits to you? No. no. Good answer, right? No. You know, uh, many years ago, um, Mo Hader, um, the late Mo, the Hader, late Mo Hader, and I had, we had a conversation, and she just had her child, a wonderful young woman named Lottie. Um, but she said, you know, everybody says when you have a child that you can't write about a child being harmed anymore. But I find I want to write more about children being <laughs> Excellent answer. So we probably should wind. It's 8 o'clock and we still have a signing to go. Oh, yeah. So maybe... I got to take a picture of you guys. All right. We're going to post it. All right. Oh, I'll do a video. How's that? Oh, even better. Yes. There you go. Excellent. All right. So maybe we could have you had a final, maybe a question from you. Absolutely. The next book is a Will Trent book. Um, and, you know, sometimes I, I shift the focus around, you know, sometimes it's more Sarah or Will or Faith, and this is more Sarah. Mm -hmm. For the television series. It's, it starts out where the, the books, the first Will Trent books start out. So you see all the, the, the people of that world. Um, Sarah com will come in later. Um, but you get to see a little bit more about Will and Angie and that, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Wonderful. So we have now come to the point where we give books away to thank you all for coming this evening. Larry, do, what do we go up to or John? 38. Okay. So I have two books to give away uh -oh. tonight. That wasn't right. the number. <laughs> <laughs> so one of them, have you run across Taylor Moore yet? Yeah. I really like, this is his second book and it's called Firestorm. I did a uh, Zoom event with him for the launch party for his book. Um, and I really like Downrange a lot. And um, he has a DEA, no, he's not a DEA agent. Um, where is he? Maybe he is. Anyway, he's a federal agent operating in Texas, but there are certain espionage things that creep in. And Taylor himself is a sixth generation 
Texan and a former CIA intelligence officer who worked in analysis and operations. So he has a really good background for what he writes. So could you pick a number between one and 38 and we will give that away? I'm gonna say 38, because they, they, I think they clapped and I would hate to disappoint them. Is there a 38 here? Yes. Way back. Well, undue influence, but nonetheless, we'll give you the vote. And if you like it, Downrange is available um, as a paperback. This is my advanced reading copy. It's not a real book. Oh. So, well, it is a real book, yeah. but you know, it's um, it has it can have mistakes in it. It is not you know, Typos and things, it yeah. can have it's not fully edited. And um, sometimes when I get advanced reading copies, the cover art is different. Sometimes I come down here and I am completely surprised by the way a book looks, and I think really. All right, the, the other one I found, which I thought sounded really interesting, there's a it's called Buzz Books, Great Books for Fall and Winter. And it has excerpts from new titles by Rachel Aviv, Alice Feeney, who will be here for the very first time on um, the 30th of August. And um, she's a British author, and she's written a sort of a cross between Rebecca and Agatha Christie's, and then there were none. There's, a, there's some interesting supernatural and other elements floating into thrillers all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Lots of witches this fall. I mean, there are a load of witches coming up. <laughs> Right. Uh, John Irving, Kevin Wilson, etc. So um, anyway, I thought this is something I hardly ever get to browse, but, you know, maybe one of you would like it. So I need another number. Twelve. Twelve. Boy, oh, she's, wow. oh, look at that. Yeah, I didn't lady. have to get up. There you are. So I want to thank you all. It's really exciting to see so many of you. How many of you are new to the store who have never been here? Oh my Lord, look at that. You know, here's what we figured out, and this is an interesting thing. Our customers who've been with us for years, we've been streaming our events since 1995. And so we didn't even have to do anything different except move into Zoom from live stream. But here's the thing that our customers who've been with us for a really long time think of us now as the Netflix of the book world, and they just stay home. And, you know, but that's not as much fun for Karen. She, you know, <laughs> if she's here, it's nicer if you are here. So what we found is that the events where lots of you turn out are people who have not previously come to our events and therefore don't know that you could stay home <laughs> and watch it. So I want to encourage you to come out. We do yes. give away Don't books. Stay home. We do have <laughs> we do give away food. We do yes. give away books. And it's just a whole different experience. But if you missed any of this, you can watch it on our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. And if you know anybody that wishes they had come tonight but couldn't make it, you can direct it to them because it's just there forever. And there will be a podcast um, available. We've had almost two hundred thousand podcast nice. downloads from the audio that we make out of the recording. So, you know, it's really nice to have all this technology available, but let me say, nothing beats having you here butts and seats. It just,